All right, everybody. So this is Mr. Dion. I'm going to be your instructor for Organic Chemistry 1 this summer. Uh, if you go in our classes Canvas Shell, one of the first things that you'll find on there is our schedule for the summer. So you can see that we cover a lot of chapters in Organic Chemistry 1. There's a lot of content. And this is just a schedule that I came up with for the next eight weeks. And of course, it is a flexible schedule. So depending on when we finish chapters, I might finish a chapter Um, that at the very end of the course, I have some days hopefully allotted for some review. So towards the end, and then your final exam will be on July 8th. So something to look forward to there. So the reason why we do a lot of quizzes in Organic Chemistry 1 as opposed to, you know, just a few exams is just because there is so much content to cover in Organic Chemistry 1 that uh, the powers that be at uh, UCCS have decided that it makes more sense for us to have quizzes. So we deal with smaller ranges or smaller volumes of content at a time that you're tested on. Okay, so that's our schedule. I would recommend printing this out, probably a couple copies of it and posting it somewhere important, you know, somewhere that you're gonna look a lot in your house. Maybe I have them on my wall in my office. You could post them, you know, maybe where you do the dishes or, you know, post them on the inside of the windshield of your car, someplace that you're gonna look a lot so that you're always aware of when the quizzes are. So you don't ever have to ask, you know, when will the quiz be? And when is the homework due? And what chapter are we doing today? Because everything is covered in the schedule. All right, let's take a look at the syllabus. If you have your microphone on, if you could turn it off, that would be great. Uh, so this class runs on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. The R stands for Thursday. Um, we're going to have class from 8 to 11.30 a.m. It would probably be pretty tough for me to lecture for three and a half hours straight. So some days we might end lecture a little early. Some days we might take a break and we'll just kind of let that happen organically. No pun intended. <clears throat> now, hopefully you've all taken the time to read the syllabus as this isn't your first rodeo. You've all been university students for a while. <clears throat> uh, and so Historically, this class was taught face to face, you know, in a classroom and I gave out paper quizzes and things like that. But on account of the pandemic, it's taught completely online this summer. So again, our, our lecture schedule is 8 to 11.30 a.m. on Monday, Tuesday and Thursday from today up until July 8th, uh, which is the date of the final exam. I do my best to post the recordings of my lectures to my YouTube channel. There is no promise about that. OK, there is. Um, you know, I, I can't 100% guarantee that, but I do my best to do that. Remember, this is a synchronous course. And so I lecture, you know, during the lecture time. So if you missed the lecture and I didn't post it to YouTube, well, then you're going to have to figure that out on your own. You'll have to read the book and figure out the content because I'm not obliged to post anything to my YouTube channel. Again, I try to, I try to, but that is my out for students who try to hold me accountable for something that I'm not really responsible for. And by really responsible, I mean not responsible for. So things that you're gonna need to complete this class are a reliable internet connection, of course, for viewing live lectures. And if I post any pre-recorded content, you'll need it for that as well. You need a computer with a webcam and a microphone to take our quizzes that require Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor. And I'll talk more about those later on. And all Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus uh, Lockdown Monitor, or Respondus Monitor rather, all they are is just a way to uh, mitigate cheating uh, amongst the student body. And so again, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, you're gonna need a printer for a few things this semester. 
And uh, you'll also need a means of scanning handwritten assignments. If I give any handwritten assignments now, you don't need to invest in a scanner, a big scanner from Staples or Amazon. I don't own one and I'm the instructor of the course, but I do have an iPhone. And with an iPhone or with any kind of smartphone, there are literally Avogadro's number of apps available that are free that enable you to scan and generate uh, PDFs. And I explain the rationale behind that there. So getting into the content, Organic Chemistry 1 uh, is discussed here, you know, what you're expected to learn in Organic Chemistry 1. And in order to enter into Organic Chemistry 1, you've got to have passed General Chemistry 1 and 2 with a grade of C or better. Now, how much time do you need to spend outside of class studying for Organic Chemistry 1? My answer would be as much as possible. So uh, 12 to 15 hours, that's just an estimate that was put forth by the department. I would say for some students, it's probably more. For some students, it might be less. Again, depending on your ability to learn the material and to master the material and to memorize, you know, different things that we have to remember throughout the semester. Um, and keep in mind that organic chemistry is a cumulative subject. All chemistry classes are cumulative. What does that mean? That means that what we learn in chapter one will be imperative, uh, or it's imperative that you understand what you learn in chapter one in order for you to apply it in chapter two. You have to understand chapter four to get to chapter five. You have to understand chapter five in order to master chapter eight, so on and so forth. And so um, in my quizzes, I will, of course, emphasize the new material, the material that is um, most um, uh, the most recent material that we've covered. However, I will ask questions about older material or material that we've looked at in the weeks prior. My contact, you can always contact me by email. I check my email like everybody else, you know, probably a hundred times a day. So you can always contact me by email. Don't be afraid to um, message me by email. Do not use the messaging feature on Canvas, okay? Use your, um, your, use your uh, UCCS email account. Do not message me on Canvas. The best way to contact me, again, is by email. I do my best to answer email within 12 hours, but I try for 24 hours if I'm busy or asleep or something like that. Anyhow, if you need to speak to me, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, just let me know and we'll organize a time where we can meet and chat on Microsoft Teams and use our cameras. Um, uh, please use your campus address when emailing me. Do not email me from a Hotmail or a Gmail account or anything like that. It's, I'm going to ignore it, okay? You, everybody has access to their UCCS email account, so you will want to use that. The course outcomes are covered here, all the different things that you're going to learn throughout the semester, how to draw mechanisms, how to draw organic compounds, how to, you know, um, uh, synthesize small molecules. That's what we'll look at towards the end of the class. You'll learn about reaction mechanisms, kinetics, thermodynamics. Um, you'll also learn about NMR spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy, mass spectrometry, and uh, you're going to learn about retrosynthetic analysis. Again, uh, that will be towards the end of the course, so you can read that in your time. The materials that you need, everybody needs to have the textbook. I guess you could go to the bookstore at UCCS and buy it, or you could look online and maybe buy a used copy or a new copy. However, everybody in the class has access to the electronic textbook, and you have 100% access to the solutions manual as well. Not an answer, not an answer guide, a solutions manual. And if you are paying attention to your email or following the announcements on Canvas, you'll see that I posted an announcement on Canvas wherein I posted a video that shows you how to access the solutions manual. So not only does it show you how to get to our textbook, but it shows you how to get to the solutions manual as well. Molecular models are handy to have in organic chemistry. They're not required, but I think they're pretty handy, especially if you struggle with um, converting images that are in two dimensions into three dimensions in your mind and going back and forth. And that's something that we'll look at once we get into chapter five. Um, everybody has to have access to Canvas. I recommend just logging into Canvas and poking around the class and looking around to see what I have on there. Uh, I, I can see student uh, involvement in Canvas, and I see that most students have already logged into Canvas. Some students have even logged in, you know, more than 100 times. So I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but yeah, you can go in and look and download all the slides and everything's in there. So as far as quizzes go, we have 13 quizzes in this class. That is where the majority of your grade comes from. The weight, uh, percent weighting for the quizzes is 70%. Your final is worth 20%, and the homework is worth 10%. Now, in order for me to drop your lowest quiz score, you have to write all 13. Okay, you can't say, well, I was sick for one of them. Okay, so there's one missed quiz. Uh, my grandfather died. Okay, there's another missed quiz. I was in a car accident. You know, there's the third one. No, 
in order for me to drop um, your lowest score, you have to write all 13 quizzes. If you, if, you write, if you write 12 quizzes, I will not drop your lowest quiz score. You've got to write all 13 quizzes, okay? Um, and so if you miss more than one quiz, so if you miss one quiz, that would count as your drop quiz because you would receive a score of zero. If you miss more than, um, than one quiz, then you would receive a zero for any quiz that's missed beyond that. Homework assignments. I think that most of the homework assignments are published now. I double check them or I check them. I shouldn't say I double check them, but I checked them last night on Canvas and they should all be available. Um, again, they're weighted to 10 percent of your grade. The due dates are shown in the schedule. For most of them, I gave you a little bit of extra time. But again, I would always go by the schedule. OK, go by the schedule and make sure you have it submitted by that date to receive full credit. Can you submit homework late? Absolutely, you can. OK, but the maximum score that you can get is 50 percent. So if you get 100 percent, you would get a 50 percent. So, again, you can complete a homework late. No problem. But you only get half of the credit for it. Um, again, no makeup quizzes are provided. The whole thing about uh, missing quizzes is in here. So I guess it's in this point right here. Um, again, you've got to write 13 quizzes in order to have a quiz dropped. Uh, if you tr if you write 12 or less, I'm not going to drop any quizzes and any quizzes that you miss will receive a score of zero um, graded quizzes. Well, most of our quizzes will be written online, so they should be graded really quickly. Uh, anyhow, the whole thing about cheating, uh, you have to be honest um, and I'll talk more about Respondus Lockdown Browser later on with you in the class closer to the quiz. I'll give you all the instructions about that. Our census date again is May 24th. As far as online classroom courtesy, usually my students are pretty courteous about that uh, and are very good about their online, um, you know, classroom netiquette, if you will. Uh, just, you know, make sure you show up to class on time. And if you have a question, you can either unmute your mic or you can type in the chat like you can see me typing in the chat right now. I have two computers screens so I can see, you know, what my students are typing in there. If you have a question, I usually try to regret, uh, address it. Um, withdrawing from the organic chemistry lecture, uh, the final uh, day to withdraw from the course and remain in the lab is the sixth week of the semester. You can read all the information there and then about the course evaluation. The Science Center, I'm unsure as to whether the Science Center is open this summer. So that's why I said I'll post an announcement about that because I'm not even 100 percent sure. I have to talk to um, Dr. Phillips about that and I'll let you know more about that. If you have accommodations due to a disability, please let me know by email and uh, we can discuss that. If you're in the military, you can read the part about military students. And of course, information in this syllabus is subject to change. You never know when things might change. We are still in the midst of the pandemic. So moving on, I just wanted to take a quick look at our classes uh, shell in Canvas. Now this is my Canvas. When I open it up, this is what mine looks like. Yours won't look exactly like this. Um, anyhow, but here's our class, Organic Chemistry 1 Summer. So if I open it up and I open up Student View, so this is what you would see. Your, your um, Canvas will look something like this. So you see I have a whole module here, here called Getting Started. You have um, links to the syllabus and schedule, the textbook, and uh, Respondus instructions, again, which I'll talk about more later on in the class, closer to the quiz. Uh, you have a link to announcements. So if you open up the announcements tab, you can see all the announcements. In fact, I posted one just a few minutes ago, 7.52. That class would start at 8 a.m. Here's the, here's the announcement about how to access the solutions manual here. So you can take a look at that video as to how to access the solutions manual. I'll try to do it this morning with you to show you. But you see that all of the slides are already posted. So chapter one slides, chapter two, three, four, 14, all of the slides are posted. You can download those. They are not protected. Or anything you can open up the powerpoints you can convert them to pdfs you can print them out you can share them with a loved one all i ask is that my students are honest and do not post them to the internet okay i don't want to see my slides somewhere saying mr dion posted these to the internet they are my slides so i give them to my students and you can use them for your own personal uh, use while you're uh, taking a class anyhow also, you'll see, say, for example, in chapter one, it says suggested problems. So if you look at the back of our textbook or the look at the, at the end of every chapter, you'll see that there's lots of practice problems in there and throughout the chapter. There's problems as well. 
So instead of you having to wade through all the problems and deciding which ones are most important, I've actually gone through all the problems and I'm telling you which ones I think are the most important problems. Can you do them all? Absolutely. But every once in a while, we skip sections of chapters. And so this is a list of problems. So the ones that are inside the chapter are listed here, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, so on and so forth. At the end of chapter, 1.35, 3.6, 3.7, so on and so forth. So that saves you a little bit of time in terms of waiting around through the chapter and deciding you know, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Uh, links to the quizzes, I haven't posted any of those yet, but I will later on this week. And you can see that the online homework is all posted here. First, there's a little primer called Introduction to Wiley Plus, and that's really handy for Chemistry 3101 students because I'm going to assume that you haven't used Wiley Plus before. That kind of, it's not worth any points, the introduction. You see it says zero points by it, but it's just a primer to kind of show you how to use the drawing tools and things like that because there's a, probably a little bit of a learning curve there. And then we have all the homework assignments, chapter one, two, three, four, and you can access those um, today if you want to. Uh, you see that the dates get a little wonky towards the end. You see chapter 8 says April 2nd, April 12th. So I guess I'm good up until chapter 7 or so, but I'll have to adjust the dates for 8, 15, 9, and 10, but I'll do that. I'm sure that nobody's itching to do chapter 15 homework today on the first day. So again, you have the first, you know, seven homework assignments that are available, and I think that's enough for the first day of class, all right? Anyhow, so yeah, so again, I would recommend doing that introduction to Wiley Plus to familiarize yourself with Wiley Plus. Now I'm going to try something here. I'm going to exit student view. So leave student view because it won't work since I'm not a student. But you see where it says textbook in the getting started module. If I click on the Wiley Plus read, study, and practice, it opens up this tab and then I'm going to click on it. It opens it up and it brings you to the Wiley Plus page and you can access the book or you can read the book if you click on these links down here at the bottom. However, I don't ever use that. The way that I do it is you see where it says read, study, and practice? Right to the right of that, it says downloadable e-textbook. I'm going to click on that. And this is where I would read the textbook from because this is the actual electronic textbook. Okay, so let it open up here. Let's give it a second. So here is chapter one. So if you're reading chapter one, you can see I've highlighted a few things in my textbook. But anyhow, if you're reading chapter one, and let's say I assigned question 1.1, and I did, there's question 1.1. Draw all constitutional isomers with the following molecular formula. So you'd say you wanna try 1.1a. Where do you find the solution to that? You click on the number 1.1. So I'm gonna click on that, and it opens up not the answers, it opens up probably the best solutions manual I've ever seen in my life. And I was a student for a long time, and I've taught for a long time as well. So let's see if it works. Let's give it a second here. After I waxed poetic about it, it won't open. Just wait and see. Give it a second. Oh, I don't know why. I kind of figured this might happen if I tried to present. You know, there's only a few absolutes in life, three of them. Death is one, taxes is another. And when you try to show somebody something on a computer, the computer won't work. Like you can surf the internet all day, but if you try to show something to a friend, it won't work. So here you go, here's the solutions manual. So it has not only just the answers, but the solutions, all solutions. So if you look at that video that I posted this morning, that's what it shows you is how to access this solutions manual. So here's the solutions manual. And besides the solutions, it also has like a study guide where it has all kinds of, you know, students will ask me, is there a summary of everything in this chapter? Well, here you go. It's a beautiful summary of everything that's learned in chapter one. Shows you all the different skill builders that there are in the textbook. So it's really great. All right. So there you go. So that's how you access the textbook. Again, the whole part about Orion and the videos and the solve problems, I never use those. Some students like to use these things like Orion and they think they're really great. If you want to use those, be my guest. I don't get involved in those. It's got nothing to do with, you know, what I do really. But um, yeah, I would recommend that as taking a look at it anyhow. All right. So let's see here. Stop presenting. All right. Are there any questions? 
any burning questions that I didn't answer. You can either unmute your mic or you could tap it, type it in the chat rather, if you have a I don't understand that question. Somebody says, uh, just, I'm, I don't, I don't even know what multi-load means. Maybe you could unmute your mic and ask me about that. There may be a lot of background in noise. That's the reason why I didn't want to I have like three dogs that are here. So they may start barking randomly. Um, the reason I'm asking that is you, I try to load the homework, but it no, won't let you load the homework and then also review anything else at the same time. No, it so won't. Is there... Yeah, Wiley only allows you to have one Wiley tab open at a time. So even me as an instructor, let's say I go in and try to edit a homework assignment, I can't have the textbook open at the same time. So with Wiley, everybody is only allowed to have one, one tab open at a time. Okay, and then my next question is in regards to the actual homework. I haven't completed it and it's already been graded. I don't understand why it's doing that. So as you as you complete it, let's say you do, let's say there's a hundred questions and you do one question. It's gonna grade that one question and it will upload that score to the grade book. Okay, so it will actually let me finish the remainder of it. Yeah, yeah. That. You can go okay. in and keep keep working on it. Yep, okay. absolutely. And then my last question for now um, is in regards again to the Wiley. How do I locate then the homework portion without having to close Wiley Plus and then click on the homework link? I don't know where it's located in Wiley Plus. So you probably can't. You have to access the homework through Canvas, right? It has to be accessed through Canvas because that way it's because the homework is linked to Canvas through into the gradebook. So in order to access the homework, you would have to close whatever you have, okay? You go into Canvas, you look under the homework tab, you click on homework number one, and then you can, you open up the homework through Canvas. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, well, there we go. If there's any further questions about it, you know, you can shoot me an email and ask me anything that you wanna know about um about wiley or technical aspects of the course but yeah everybody is only allowed to have one tab open so i have the textbook open let's say and i want to go in and edit one of your assignments can't do it okay it can only have one tab open at a time all right well let's get started and before we do i just want to mention one more thing and i'm going to open up my slides first so just give me a second to find them all right so Okay, so we're going to start with chapter one now. I just want to mention one more thing before we get rocking and rolling with it here and getting into the content. And again, you can see the chapter one is a review of things that you would have learned in general chemistry, mostly in general chemistry one. We talk a little bit about general chemistry two and organic chemistry, but mostly we stick to uh, general chemistry one. Anyhow, one thing that comes up a lot in organic chemistry, as I've taught the class many, many times, is that I have a lot of students who are interested in the medical field. And I'm going to talk about why organic chemistry, um, uh, what, how it's related to the medical field several times throughout the course. But, um, you know, st students will ask me, you know, why is organic chemistry such a good litmus test for students that want to enter into a medical school or maybe a, a dental school or a pharmacy, a college of pharmacy or something of that ilk? And again, I know that not all students are interested in that, and that's totally fine. But the reason why I would say is threefold, okay? Number one is just the volume of material that's covered. We cover a huge volume of material. You're gonna see that right away. And number two is the pace at which we cover it, okay? So not only do we cover a lot of concepts, but we cover them quickly. There's not a lot of time to go back and, you know, rediscuss and, 
and, um, and, and go over everything and review and review and review. You have to kind of keep moving to cover all the content in organic chemistry. And number three is that you have to be able to remember it. Okay. Remember it and apply it later. Okay. So what we learn in chapter one, you've got to be able to apply it when we get to chapter 15. So that's quite a ways down the road. You know, you've got to be able to apply what you learned in chapter two in July. And so, you know, the reason why that is, if you think about a medical doctor or a nurse or, you know, a pharmacist, they have to have some kind of encyclopedic knowledge of their uh, area of expertise. Okay. They have to have a, quite a breadth of knowledge. And the reason why you think about if you were to go to the doctor and say, you know what, doctor, I have a problem with my knee. I, you know, I move it back and forth and it makes a clicking sound. It kind of hurts when I put too much weight on it. And, you know, I'm just not sure, you know, could you help me with my knee? If your doctor said, well, you know what, this week I'm kind of focusing on the, on the eyeball. So I'm just thinking about eyeballs this week and that's what I'm studying this week. You know, it wouldn't really be an acceptable answer. Now, I understand that nobody knows everything. That's impossible. However, the reason why organic chemistry makes such a good litmus test for things like medical schools is because, you know, you need to have those kind of skills that cover a lot of material quickly and you have to be able to remember it. Anyhow, so with that in mind, uh, let's get into chapter one. So uh, you're going to hear me say general chemistry one probably, you know, many, many times throughout this chapter and probably the, the first few chapters in organic chemistry because the first chapter is nothing but a review of what you learn in general chemistry. But again, it's mostly what you learn in general chemistry one, right? I know a lot of you took general chemistry two last semester where you talked about kinetics and thermodynamics and acids and bases and electrochemistry and all that good stuff. And those things are important. Of course, we are going to talk a little bit about reaction rates. We'll talk a little bit about thermodynamics and thermochemistry, of course. But uh, largely, we're going to focus on general chemistry one. So let's get into it here. Uh, section 1.1, organic chemistry is the study of carbon containing molecules and their reactions. If you look at your periodic table, element number six is carbon. It's sandwiched in between boron and nitrogen. You think about general chemistry one, you spent an entire year discussing the entire periodic table. You learn the periodic trends. You learn about, you know, electron configuration and all those great things, electron affinity, ionization energy. And you were looking at the periodic table as a whole. All the different elements showed up, you know, at least probably at some point in your general chemistry classes. However, now you're going to take a whole year, you know, this uh, first, you know, uh, uh, organic chemistry one in organic chemistry two to discuss one element in the periodic table just to talk about carbon. And there's a good reason for that. OK, and we'll uncover that as we get into the content in organic chemistry one. Why do we have to spend so much time talking about this one element? We're going to talk about what happens to a molecule during a reaction. You know what happens in a reaction? Well, molecules collide. We break bonds, we make bonds in reactions. Here's a reaction taking place. You see these funny looking arrows here that are red? These are what we call curved arrows and they represent the flow of two electrons. We're gonna talk about those in detail later on in the class. But what's happening here is that you see that this arrow represents a bond being formed. So this is a bond being formed. And this curved arrow represents a bond being broken. So we're breaking a bond and we're making a bond simultaneously in this reaction here. And, you know, one of the questions that we want to address in organic chemistry one is why do reactions like these even happen? And it takes two semesters to really figure that out. But one thing you're going to see in organic chemistry is that we spend most of our time focusing on electrons. So what did you learn about electrons, right? You learned that the charge of an electron is negative. You learned about electron configuration. Lewis structure. So all of those things are going to be important in organic chemistry. How do we distinguish between organic and inorganic compounds? You know, my wife will go to the grocery store and come back and say, oh, these bananas are organic. And I'd say, well, I wouldn't want to eat an inorganic banana. You know, I don't want to eat any inorganic food. So, you know, you can get into arguments with people about this and, you know, you get driven crazy if you're an organic chemist because we don't consume inorganic foods. We only eat organic foods. But the way that we distinguish between organic compounds and inorganic compounds are that organic compounds contain carbon. Are there exceptions to this rule? Yeah. 
There's a couple of exceptions. For example, the carbonate uh, polyatomic ion and the cyanide and the cyanate in our textbook refers to those at the very beginning. Those are polyatomic ions that contain carbon that are not considered organic. However, organic compounds generally are compounds that contain carbon atoms, very few exceptions. And, um, you know, why are organic compounds so important? Well, I could sit here for the next hour and talk to you about why organic compounds are so important. They make up, again, the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear. Let's say you are wearing, you know, uh, a, a raincoat that's made of uh, that's made of Gore-Tex, you know, that's a polymer, that's an organic polymer, or let's say you're wearing a cotton t-shirt that's made from cellulose fibers, which is, you know, our, our carbon-containing sugars, of course. Um, pharmaceuticals is a big one. Um, most people wouldn't want to go back, you know, in time, let's say 50 or 60 years ago and live with the medications that, you know, we only had at our disposal at those, that time, right? The pharmaceutical industry seeks to find ways to enhance and improve the quality of human lives through the development of new drugs and also plastics. Like I said, polymers would be a big one. And the thing is, is that um, chemists thought, or scientists, I should say, thought for a long time that the distinction between organic and inorganic compounds were that um, organic compounds uh, could only be made through what is called a vital force. There was some kind of vital force, which is, you know, we know is not true, but they thought that there was some kind of vital force that was necessary to make organic compounds. And again, our textbook goes into a little bit more detail uh, about that. But what I think is most important is that the scientific community thought, well, there's no way that you can make an organic compound from inorganic starting materials. And Friedrich Wohler did an experiment in 1828 where he showed that you could take ammonium cyanate, which is an inorganic compound. It's just an inorganic salt that was well known. And he took it and he heated it up and he produced urea. And urea is an organic compound that had been isolated from the urine of uh, human beings and dogs. And so he said, I was able to make urea without the aid of dog or man. And this dealt a serious blow to the theory of vitalism. And then many more experiments were performed wherein scientists showed that they could, or scientists showed that they could take inorganic compounds and convert them into organic compounds. So kind of interesting there. And if we move on from there, we're going to talk about what's called structural theory. So structural theory, how are substances put together? In the mid-1800s, it says that it was first suggested that substances were defined by a specific arrangement of atoms, right? If you go back to your general chemistry days and you talk about where does the word atom come from? You know, when I was a kid, I used to think, what if you took something like, I don't know, a rock, okay? And you cut it in half, then you took that half and you cut it in half, then you took that half and you cut it in half and you kept cutting and cutting and cutting until you got down to the smallest bit. Well, the Greek philosopher Democritus thought, that I had thought of that too, you know, way before I thought of it. And he said, you know, the smallest particle that you could obtain, the smallest particle that you could cut it, you know, whatever substance you're looking at into, he called that atomos, which is where the word atom came from. So um, after further experiments, you know, scientists figured out, okay, well, we have atoms and they knew about, you know, carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and sulfur, of course, and silicon and aluminum, and right? Uh, metals like copper and zinc were, have been known for a long time. But they said, well, how do you make compounds from those elements? And it wasn't until the mid-1800s that scientists determined, well, you have to organize those atoms in such a, uh, or a specific way, I should say, in order to make a compound. But we can take the same elements and we can combine them together to make different compounds. Let's say we had two carbon atoms six hydrogens and an oxygen, like this C2H6O. Well, there's two different ways that we could combine those elements to make compounds. And you see those two compounds here. We have dimethyl ether and we have ethanol. Dimethyl ether is a commonly used propellant in aerosol cans, like for anything from, let's say, whipped cream to spray paint to, I don't know, hairspray. Okay, and ethanol, of course, I'm sure most of you are familiar with ethanol. It's the alcohol that's found in alcoholic beverages like a Coors Light or you know, a glass of wine or something like that. But although these two compounds are made out of the same elements, they're both made of two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen, 
you see that they have very different physical properties, don't they? You see that all we have shown here are their boiling points, but one boils at minus 23 degrees Celsius. That means at a room temperature, it's a gas, whereas ethanol at room temperature is a liquid. Okay, you know, um, if and if you're like, oh, I'm not sure if I understand this. Well, think about it this way. Let's say I sent everybody in the class to Home Depot uh, and I'd have to give you, you know, several million million dollars in order for you to buy a few two by fours. You know, I said everybody gets three sheets of plywood, you know, uh, you know, 100 two by fours. And I don't know what else, maybe a couple of stacks of shingles. OK, build something. Well, we're all starting with the same content or the same starting materials but we're making we would probably you know maybe one person would make a chicken coop and the other person might make a dog house or i don't know what you could make a playhouse or something anyhow but we could all make different things and so that's the concept here the constitution of these two compounds dimethyl ether and ethanol <clears throat> is the same in both cases however their structures are different and therefore their physical properties are different as well so constitutional isomers you have to know what constitutional isomers are in organic chemistry. And we'll look at, we will look at several other types of isomers throughout this class. So besides constitutional isomers, we'll look at stereoisomers in chapter five. Anyhow, um, atoms that bind to carbon. Well, lots of different atoms bind to carbon. Things like nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. The halogens, of course. Other elements that aren't even listed on here. What about... Could you form a carbon bond to sulfur? Absolutely. Silicon, right? Phosphorus, you know, and I could keep going from there. But that's one of the reasons why there are so many organic compounds is because carbon can bind to so many different atoms and also carbon can bind to other carbon atoms. So when looking at um, these elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and the halogens, the reason that we're, you know, really getting into these um, a few elements right at the get-go is because these elements come up a lot in organic chemistry one. In fact, they're going to come up, you know, almost Avogadro's number of times. Generally speaking, carbon will always form four bonds. Okay, now, there are, are there exceptions to this? Yes, when carbon has a positive charge, it will only have three bonds. When carbon has a negative charge, it will have three bonds in a lone pair. However, when carbon is uncharged, and it's neutral, it's going to form four bonds. And we say that it's tetravalent. And you should have learned that in general chemistry one, and you should have think, talked about things like hybridization, and we'll review that in this chapter. Nitrogen generally forms three bonds. It usually, uh, sorry, three bonds in a lone pair, but we'll just go with the three bonds for now. Oxygen will always form two bonds. And hydrogen and the halogens will generally always form one bond. Now for fluorine and hydrogen, there's no exception to that. Fluorine can only ever form one bond. Hydrogen can only ever form one bond. Yes, I, I, I studied general chemistry one. I know that there are exceptions to the rule once you get to the third period and beyond, um, where we see that uh, elements chlorine, bromine, and iodine can expand their octets. We're not gonna see any expanded octets in, uh, in organic chemistry one, so you don't even have to think about that. But if you're wondering, you know, did I see examples of these kind of things in general chemistry one? Well, think about a compound like CO2. You should have seen the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide, and you see that the carbon has four bonds in carbon dioxide. What about a compound like ammonia, right? NH3, the nitrogen has three bonds. It also has a lone pair. What about water? The oxygen in water has two bonds, and it has two lone pairs like that. You can see that the hydrogen only has one bond. Um, the halogens forming one bond. I mean, you can come up with all kinds of answers, right? You have HF, HCl, HBr, HI, right? These are all examples of compounds where the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine have only one bond. And again, I told you that hydrogen and fluorine, they only ever form one bond. There's no exception. However, in organic chemistry one, we won't really look at any examples where um, we'll have a polyvalent halogen. So having, you know, uh, an expanded octet, okay? That will never come up in organic chemistry one. Well, with that in mind, that's enough material for now. Let's try a, a, some practice problems. So we're gonna get an early start on your, you know, practicing. And this is question 1.1 straight out of our textbook. Again, if you wanna see the solution to this problem, you would click on number 1.1.
However, let me caution you about the solutions manual, okay? The solutions manual can be a great friend to students. However, it can also be an enemy to students. And let me explain why I say that, okay? It's because oftentimes students will, you know, maybe get, let's say, 80% of the way through a problem, and then they can't figure out the last part of it. And they're like, ah, I can't figure it out. So they'll look up in the solutions manual, and they'll say, oh, 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 okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I get it. Oh, it was just a... I was missing a lone pair here. I was missing a negative charge here. Now I've got it. The thing is, when you see the answer, it should make sense because if the answer is correct, well, it's, it's supposed to be sensible, right? Organic chemistry is logical. However, if you just peek at the answer, you know, to help you, well, you didn't really come up with the answer, did you, right? And that's, there's a big difference between looking at somebody solving a problem or looking at a solutions manual and it making sense and there's a giant gap between that and you being able to come up with the answer by yourself, you know, when you're alone uh, taking the exam with Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor. So just kind of a, a word of caution. Let me tell you another example is I don't know if any of you have ever had Dr. Diaz as an instructor at UCCS, but he and I shared an office and we still do, uh, which we'll hopefully get back into one of these days. But um, we teach general chemistry and, you know, have hundreds of students in those classes and oftentimes we'll get students come to our office and say, you know, I studied really hard. I did all the practice problems for, you know, chap this chapter. And, you know, I, I didn't get the grade I wanted on the exam. Let's say they got a, maybe a 60% or something. And I said, you know, we'd say, you did all the practice problems? Yes, I did all the practice problems. And then we'll ask them, okay, well, I'll open up the textbook and say, okay, well, here's one of those practice problems. Question 20, can you solve it? And 99 times out of 100, the student won't be able to solve the problem. And it's not because they didn't study. It's not because they didn't work hard. It's because, you know, they were kind of using the solutions manual to leverage their way through the problem. So, again, I don't want to start it on a negative note just by trying to scare you or anything like that. It's just the reality, you know, of being a student. And I was a student for a long time. Anyhow, let's take a look at the first question. 1.1a, we have C3H7Cl. Well, what do we know? We know that carbon is tetravalent, right? Carbon always forms four bonds like this. We also know that hydrogen is only going to form one bond and chlorine is only ever going to form one bond. Based on that information, it's like putting a puzzle together. There's really only one way that we could link the carbons together, and that's to have all three of them linked together like that, because then we can have each carbon having a total of four bonds like this. Now we have seven hydrogens and one chlorine. So if I start putting the hydrogens around the molecule like this, and I'm just gonna put them like this, and I put the chlorine like this, there we go. We've drawn a constitutional isomer, and if I make a correct Lewis structure, I'll put the lone pairs on the chlorine like this. So this molecule is called 2-chloropropane, and it's neither here nor there. The name, we'll not worry about that right now, but I have a question for my students who are online currently. Could anybody tell me how I would draw a constitutional isomer of this compound, or is there a constitutional isomer? Could anybody tell me what I could do to draw a constitutional isomer of this compound? Um, can you just uh, bond chlorine to the first or third carbon, which will be the first? Right, so the student is saying, could you put the chlorine you know, over here? And I would say, absolutely. So let me try using the copy paste tool on the iPad. Which I'm not the greatest at, but let's give it the old college try. So let's say we do this, okay? And we're gonna take that chlorine. And the student said, we'll remove it from there. We'll move a hydrogen and we're gonna put the chlorine here and we'll put a hydrogen here, okay? And that is absolutely correct. Now, a knee jerk reaction that some students might have now is let's say, well, hold on. You know, well, let me just ask you, is there another constitutional isomer that I can draw? Yes or no? Okay. No, because it ends up being the same th th thing from different direction directions. Right. So what the student is saying is that there's no constitutional isomer that can be drawn. No other constitutional isomer. So again, it might be a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, I'll take that chlorine and I'll move it over here like this. However, if you do that, these two compounds are the exact same. Okay, these two compounds in the yellow circle are identical. If I number the carbons one, two, three, you can see that the chlorine is on the first carbon. 
If I number this one, one, two, three, you can see the chlorine is on the first carbon. So there is no difference between these compounds. Those two compounds are exactly the same. So let me get rid of some of this scratch here. Now, another knee-jerk reaction might be to say, well, what if I took the chlorine and I moved it down here, right, like this, and then I have a constitutional isomer here. You know, these two are constitutional. Those are not constitutional isomers of each other. Those two compounds are identical, right, because you have free rotation around all sigma bonds. And so, in fact, these are the only two constitutional isomers that you can draw for this molecular formula, okay? The first one is called 2 chloro chloropropane propane and the second one is called one chloro propane all right two chloropropane and one chloropropane there is no other way that i can arrange those atoms to make a different compound now um this is an, uh, a good example of where um handheld models might come in handy okay so if you Buy a model kit off of Amazon. You can buy one for probably twenty dollars. That will cut, you know, cut the mustard, and um, that might be handy. You know, if you're trying to figure out, well, why can't I connect these a different way? But these are the only two ways that I can connect these atoms to make two constitutional isomers: one and two, two chloropropane. Well, the next one is C4H10. So now I don't even have another atom, right? I only have four carbons and ten hydrogens. But remember that carbon always forms four bonds, okay? And hydrogen can only ever form one bond, one possibility for the hydrogen. And so the ways that I could link those together would be either to have all four carbons in a row like this, and then I complete each carbon so that it has four bonds like this. And I'm gonna fill each one of these up with a hydrogen, okay? And you can see that we have a total of 10 hydrogens and four carbons. Now, this one's a little bit more difficult to answer over Microsoft Teams, but I'll just give it a try. Um, this molecule is called butane, the same butane that's in a butane lighter or a butane curling iron, if you like to curl your hair out in the middle of the forest. Um, anyhow, so butane. Is there another way that I could connect these atoms? And again, it's not easy to describe over Teams, but you could try. A central carbon with uh, three carbon carbon bonds. Yes, yeah, exactly. One hydrogen yeah. bond. Yeah, so if I took, so the student is saying if you had the carbon and you had a central carbon and you attached it to three carbons like this, and then he said if you only had one hydrogen here, well, now this carbon has four bonds, doesn't it? Now, all the other carbons, the way that it's drawn right now, they each have one bond. So if I complete one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Well, look, if you add three times three up, you get nine. And I have nine hydrogens left over. So if I fill in all my hydrogens like this, I get a constitutional isomer. And this is called isobutane, isobutane. All right. And again, the names aren't important. I'm not going to ask you, you know, what's the structure of isobutane, you know, because we're going to get into, nom into nomenclature of organic compounds later on in the class. Again, the take home message from this, from this question, this example, is that you have to be able to take the molecular formula and if I ask you to draw the constitu constitutional isomers, you've got to be able to do it. So if you want more practice in this, where would you go? You go to our textbook and take a look at some other practice problems in there. So drawing constitutional isomers. So again, I'm just rehashing, you have to know um, the fact that carbon is going to form three, uh, four bonds, that nitrogen will form three, oxygen forms two, hydrogen and the halogens will form one in organic chemistry one. Well, what is a bond? Right? We have all these bonds, right? If I take the yellow pen here, right? All of these are covalent bonds, aren't they? Right? Everybody here knows the difference between covalent and ionic bonds. Well, what is uh, a bond, right? And I'm sure that you could all answer me and say, well, it's the sharing of electrons, you know, between atoms, okay? Because in general chemistry one, you would have learned about um, polar covalent bonds, non-polar covalent bonds, ionic bonds. Well, let's talk about how a covalent bond forms, right? The whole concept behind 
um, two atoms sharing electrons, right? Because in every one of the covalent bonds that I circled in the last slide, there was two electrons, right? There's two electrons in this bond. Any covalent bond has two electrons in it. Well, why do two atoms share their electrons to form a bond? There's got to be a reason, doesn't there? Yeah, absolutely. So let's say we had two hydrogen atoms that were infinitely far apart or very far apart from each other so that they're not interacting with each other at all, right? We see the internuclear distance is getting larger as we go this way, okay? And then on the y-axis, we have energy. Well, there is an interaction between the two atoms as you bring them closer and closer, isn't there? Right? There's the repulsive forces between the two protons that are in each of the nuclei, right? What is the hydrogen atom? It's the first element in the periodic, ta periodic table. Hydrogen has one proton and one electron. So there's the repulsive forces between the two protons and the two atoms. There's the repulsive forces between the two electrons in the two atoms. But there's also the forces of attraction between the proton of one nucleus and the electron of the other hydrogen. All right, so what happens as we bring these two hydrogen atoms closer and closer together is we start to see that the attractive forces are going to pull those atoms closer and closer together until they reach an energy minimum where the attractive forces are maximized and the repulsive forces are minimized. And that internuclear distance between the two hydrogens is measured to be 0.74 angstroms. The amount of energy that is released, and we see that the enthalpy is, you know, negative 436, and that means the energy was released when we brought them from here, which is zero on the energy scale, right? They released energy. Well, that um, amount of energy that's released is called the bond enthalpy or the bond strength is what we would call it. So the internuclear distance, 0.74 angstroms, represents that minimum of energy. It represents the maximum attraction between the two nuclei, okay, or between the two atoms, I should say, and that defines not only the internuclear distance, but it also defines the bond strength or the bond enthalpy. Now, notice if you were to take the two atoms and you start pushing them closer and closer together, is what's happening over here, right? They're getting closer and closer. Well, then the repulsive forces are going to increase and it's going to push the two atoms away. So that's what a bond is, okay? That's what a covalent bond is. Well, you should all know that a proton has a positive one charge, an electron has a negative one charge. Protons reside inside the nucleus. You should also know what a neutron is, too. We don't spend a lot of time talking about isotopes until we get into NMR spectroscopy. Um, electrons uh, outside of the nucleus, you should know electron configuration, and we'll talk about that briefly uh, today. You should know what valence electrons are, right? Valence are electrons are the electrons that exist in the outermost shell. So let's say we looked at carbon, okay? We have carbon, and if I asked you to write out the electron configuration for carbon, you should be able to say it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Well, which electrons are the valence electrons? Those are the outermost electrons, right? Those are the ones with the highest principal quantum number. That would be the 2s2 and the 2p2. So carbon has a total of four valence electrons, and that's why the Lewis structure of carbon we draw the carbon with one, two, three, four dots around it like that because it's got four valence electrons. And if you're not 100% sure about what I'm talking about, uh, we're going to get into valence electrons a little more. And we'll talk about Lewis structures a little more. Uh, valence electrons are what we're going to spend basically the entire semester talking about, you know, when it comes to reactivity because they're the ones that are involved in bonding, right? The inner or core electrons are not involved in bonding. So they will not be a major focus in organic chemistry one. Well, let's take a look at a slide that shows a periodic table, right? Here's carbon right here, but of course we're gonna talk about other elements as well. Um, you can always figure out the number of valence electrons by analyzing the electron configuration. That's kind of a hard way of doing it. Or you can just look at the group number. As long as you know, you know, group 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7a and 8a, you can determine the number of valence electrons because the group number tells you the number of valence electrons, right? For example, nitrogen has five valence electrons, as does phosphorus and arsenic, right? Um, oxygen has six valence electrons because it's in group 6a. The halogens all have seven valence electrons. 
The noble gases all have eight valence electrons with the exception of helium, which only has two because helium is in the first period, which only has the S orbital available to it. So it's only got two. But if you go to neon, for example, neon has a complete octet. And we'll talk a little bit more about the octet rule later on. The transition metals, you know, if you're wondering, you know, will transition metals come up in organic chemistry? A little bit, a little bit. More so in organic chemistry, too, I would say. But uh, they might come up from time to time, you know, especially if we're talking about ionic compounds. Uh, uh, we might bring up a transition metal now and again in a reagent or something like that later on in the class. Now, with respect to Lewis structures, in order for, for a student to master organic chemistry, she or he has to be a master of Lewis structures. They're so important. They come up constantly in organic chemistry one. They come up constantly in organic chemistry two. So much so that uh, even if students are usually shaky or just find Lewis structures a little challenging at first, usually students will master it. You know, they will master it because they come up so much that eventually you get kind of sick of drawing them. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I know how this is going to go together. But how do we draw a Lewis structure? And we get some practice in that when we put the constitutional isomers together. We're going to use Lewis dot symbols to represent the valence electrons of each atom. And I showed you how to do that on the last uh, slide with the periodic table. And then we're going to put the atoms together in such a way that they share pairs of electrons to make octets. Now, obviously, hydrogen does not make an octet, right? Hydrogen makes a duet, right? Hydrogen only needs two electrons. And why? Because hydrogen is in the first period, right? It only has the S electrons available to it. So if you have just a 1S orbital, what's the maximum number of electrons you can put in an S orbital? It's two, right? So let's say we have NH3, ammonia, okay? And that's a name you should have learned in general chemistry one, ammonia. It's found in Windex and many other household cleaners. Well, nitrogen is in group 5A, so it has five valence electrons. Hydrogen is in group 1A. It's got one valence electron. Well, how would I put those together in such a way that the nitrogen has a complete octet and the hydrogen has a complete duet? Well, you can see that it's kind of, manifested itself here on the slide, but we will never draw Lewis structures as is shown here. Now, depending on where you did your general chemistry, I'm going to assume that most students did it uh, or took general chemistry at UCCS, but not everybody. And if you didn't, we will never draw a Lewis structure this way. Okay. We would always draw a Lewis structure like this, where covalent bonds are represented by a line. Okay. And then unpaired electrons will be represented as dots. So if we look at the Lewis dot symbol of ammonia, right, there's two electrons here, there's two electrons in here, there's two electrons in that bond as well. So all the bonds have two electrons. Now, how many electrons are surrounding the nitrogen? Every bond represents two electrons that are shared. Right? So it means the nitrogen is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. So the nitrogen has a complete octet. So the nitrogen is perfectly happy. What about the hydrogen? The hydrogen has one bond attached to it. So it is surrounded by two electrons and it only needs two to complete its duet. All right, so there you go. So there's a Lewis structure for ammonia. With that in mind, um, how do we put our Lewis dot structures together are Lewis structures. We draw the individual atoms, okay, using dots to represent the valence electrons, and then we put them together so that they share electrons to make complete octets. Let me see here. I don't have a lot of space to solve these, but let's give these ones a try. So when I teach general chemistry, the way that I do this with my students is I say the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tally up the total number of valence electrons in this compound. So we have C2H4. Could anybody tell me how many total valence electrons we have in C2H4? And it's not a trick question. One thing you'll find about me is I don't like trick questions. So it's just an honest question. Thanks, Bruna. Exactly. There's 12 valence electrons in C2H4. If you're wondering, how did he figure that out? Well, carbon is in group 4A. There's two carbons. So four valence electrons times two, right? Hydrogen is in group 1A. It's got one valence electron, and there's four of those. So four times two is eight. 
plus four gives me 12 valence electrons. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to sit here for a half an hour and try to work out this problem, but I'll give you a few seconds to see if you can draw a reasonable Lewis structure for this compound. And I'm going to get a drink of water. Just give me a second. All right, so with those 12 valence electrons, the carbons have to be bound together, don't they? All right, the carbons must be bound together. Now, I've got, if I've got two carbons connected by a sigma bond, all I've used up is two electrons. So that means I have 10 electrons left. Well, what if I put two hydrogens on each of these? Do either of the carbons in the structure that I have drawn, do either of them have a complete octet? Thanks, Allison. It's a big no, isn't it, right? It, we don't have a complete octet here for either carbon. The hydrogens have complete duets, but if you look at, let's say this carbon here, it's surrounded by what? One, two, three, four, five, six electrons. So if you six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 electrons, that means I have two electrons left. Where would I put those two electrons so that my carbons have a complete, uh, a complete octet? Could anybody tell me what I would do next? Double bond to carbon? Yeah, absolutely. I'd put a double bond between the two carbons like this. Let me clean up my double bond like that. There we go. Now, each of the carbons has a complete octet. I've used up all 12 electrons, and I've made a molecule. So this is called ethylene. So ethylene which is the same thing as ethene, if you're the kind of person that wants to Google it or something. So ethylene is actually used as a fruit ripener. Um, anyhow, so how many electrons have I used up? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So we've got a total of 12 electrons used up. Both carbons have complete octets, right? This carbon has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The other electron, or the other carbon rather, has the same number of electrons, so everybody's happy. If I look at the next one, CH3OH, this is called a condensed molecular formula. If I can find it again, where was it? It's down here. CH3OH, this con condensed molecular formula, it tells you a little bit about the connectivity. It tells you that the carbon is bound to the three hydrogens, and then you have the oxygen, then you have the hydrogen attached, like kind of all in a row. And I'll show you what I mean. How many total valence electrons do we have here? We've got four plus four times one plus six. So that gives me eight plus six, which gives me a total of 14 valence electrons. Good, I think my students are faster than me. Okay, well, how would I connect those together? Well, in the interest of time, just kind of do it quicker here, but you see that you have the carbon attached to the three hydrogens. So carbon attached to one, two, three hydrogens like this. Then you have the oxygen next door. Then you have the hydrogen bound to that oxygen like this. How many electrons have I used up so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Could anybody tell me where the last four electrons would go? Yeah, exactly. They're going to be lone pairs on the oxygen, right? Because oxygen always has two bonds and two lone pairs, right? Just like in a water molecule, the oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs. So there you go. Those are some beautiful Lewis structures, my friends. This one here, this is methanol. So methanol is an alcohol just like ethanol. It's actually the simplest possible alcohol that you can have. It can also uh, get you intoxicated the same way ethanol can. However, it can uh, also kill you if you drink it, so and cause you to go blind. All right, so I wouldn't recommend ingesting methanol. All right, let's move on from there and talk about formal charge, and then maybe we'll think about taking a break 
uh, in a few minutes here. Anyhow, it says, recall the terms that we use to describe atoms with formal charges, a cation and an anion. Right, the way that I think about it is like this. If you have a cat ion, right, you get the positive charge. And if you have an in ion, you get the, you get the negative charge. Kind of looks like a, maybe like a some type of anarchy symbol in there. Anyhow, so a cation and a, a cation and an anion, you have to know what those are. You've got to know how to calculate formal charge. It says your formal charge, the number of valence electrons, subtract the number of non-bonded plus the number of bonds. I get a much easier way to do it than that. Uh, I like to think about it like this. Formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons, subtract the number of sticks, okay? Subtract the number of dots, okay? So you just take sticks are bonds and dots are unpaired electrons. So if you take a look at this one here, ALH4, well, all of the hydrogens, right? Hydrogen has one valence electron, subtract one stick. It's got no dots. So that means that all the hydrogens have a formal charge of zero. However, the aluminum, can anybody tell me what the formal charge on the aluminum is? And it's not a trick. Yeah, it's negative one, right? Because aluminum is in group 3a, so we have 3, subtract 4 sticks, subtract 0 dots, gives us negative 1. So we have a negative charge on our aluminum. The next one is hydronium, right? You should have seen hydronium a thousand times, at least, in uh, uh, general chemistry 1 and 2. So the hydrogens, the same thing. 1 valence electron, subtract 1 stick, 0 dots, gives us 0. For the oxygen... Right, we have six valence electrons, subtract six, or sorry, three sticks, subtract two dots, which gives you plus one. So we have a positive charge there. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, next, we have, this is called dimethylamide. It's a, it's a polyatomic ion, and I'll show you why in a second. I'll just ask my students, can anybody identify the charge in C, or just tell me where it would be and on what atom? Yeah, there's a negative one charge. Can anybody tell me where it would be? Yeah, exactly. There's a negative one charge on the nitrogen, right? Why? Nitrogen has five valence electrons. Subtract two sticks and four dots, which gives you negative one. Good. Is there another one? Come on. Yeah, there's one more here. So this is a protonated formaldehyde molecule. Could anybody tell me where the formal charge would be in here and what it might be? Thanks, Bruna. Yeah, it's a plus one charge. Yep, Kyla, absolutely. It's a plus one charge on the oxygen. All right, you got six valence electrons. Subtract three sticks, subtract two dots equals plus one. I like that. So that's evaluating a formal charge. Nothing to it. All right.